Hey everyone, so how do you like my uh, clickbait title? You've been lied to on purpose. <laughs> Biggest biblical lie, right? Okay. <laughs> um, wh who cares? I'll talk about this first one first. So why why am I doing this? Like this is not a normal kind of video for me to do. So one of my goals is really to analyze and solve conflicts and a great source of conflict is centered around uh, religious texts. First of all, this is considered, um, it's covered. It's been covered for a long time. It's believed to be forbidden knowledge, um, but I think the world is ready at this moment. Like I understand why it was it was uh, forbidden and why it was covered, but I think I don't think those reasons apply anymore. And we'll get into all that. So yeah, as I said, I think there's a lot of conflict around religious texts, and this is just this is one of the biggest falsehoods in the text that I think can solve. Yeah, just solving these first. So we're going to talk about the first three words of the Torah of the Bible, um, and I think. Um, Properly translating these words, it can settle a large portion of misunderstandings. It's one of the oldest and most influential books, and it's being used for argumentation on all sides, despite this lack of understanding. Um, and the questions we're going to try to answer is like, w was it changed on purpose? What was the motivation? Why was it changed? And what's the true understanding, right? So what are these first three words of the Bible? When, what do they mean, right? So we have here, Bereshit um, bara Elohim. Right. Those are the first three words. When when was this translation, this false translation started? Right. They, they weren't changed. Like the words have always been consistent, but the understanding of the words. So what happened was uh, Ptolemy II um, took 72 scholars um, and elders, uh, six from each of the 12 tribes, and uh, forced them to independently translate the Torah into Greek. Now, um, there's nothing wrong, inherently wrong with translating the text into Greek. In fact, it was believed that Greek was one of the most beautiful languages in the world and that it was probably the best language to translate it into. But because it was forced um, and because of the way it was translated, it, it, it became a problem. So, so the astonishing part is all of these 72 scholars, um, every single translation was identical. Well, this is the claim, at least. This is what the, the historic story is, including the intentional mistranslation. So even all of the little mistakes, there are several mistakes in, in the translation, but all of these mistakes are consistent, right? So the re it, all of these scholars had the same reasoning behind um, why what their translations were. Um, this translation was deemed as forbidden among Israel because it was a distortion of the text, and it was done through force. So this translation is commonly known as the Sept Septuagint. Right, and it's the basis of um, a lot of modern day translations. And there's still a fasting day, so it was it was done through force, so which is also a bad thing. And there's still a fasting day morning um, of mourning, um, where where yeah, Jews fast and commemorate this event as a tragedy until today. Right, we still do it at, once a year. We still do it. So let's get into what this translation was and what the real translation would be. So what do these first three words mean? So. Today, the translation, the current translation is, in the beginning, God created, okay? This is a common understanding. Everybody should know this. This is something that I'm sure everyone has heard before. And this is wrong. <laughs> this is just wrong. In the beginning, God created. So when we map it on right away to the words in Hebrew, Hebrew goes right to left. We have, in the beginning, created God. So right away, we see that this seems a little bit idolatrous. Um, and, and this is the main reason why it was translated differently. So in the beginning, created God means God is a creation. The beginning is the creator and uh, the beginning acted and created God, right? So this is, this seems quite idolatrous, right? And so that's why, that's why it was translated differently. So by the end of this, we'll see how um, in the beginning God created is actually, is actually more idolatrous than the correct translation of in the beginning created God. But the misunderstanding would have been more idolatrous and we'll get into it. So I actually agree that the world was not ready um, and... This will all make sense, I promise. So let's start with the first word, Bereshit. So the thing with Bereshit is it's a unique word uh, only found in this context, right? Anytime it's ever used, it's only used to refer to this Bereshit. It's not used in any other application. So we really don't know what the word means because it's never used anywhere else in Hebrew, right? Um, like you understand what the word red means because it's used in different contexts and in different applications and towards different objects. And so you abstract the idea of red from all of these different uses. Here, we can't abstract this word to understand it. It's only used here. <laughs> um, and it's a compound word. It has many other words within it. And we'll get into what all those words are. Um, and in Hebrew, every letter has a meaning. So we can try to decipher it using the Hebrew language. That's something that's special in Hebrew, is that you can almost decipher most words in Hebrew just by looking at the letters and the meaning of the letters. And we'll see that in a moment. 
So first of all, in Hebrew, there's no capital letters, but this first letter bet is larger, right? It's larger than all the others. And this happens a few times throughout the Torah. Um, so there's 16 agreed upon larger letters and throughout all of the different texts, 16 of them are consistent. Um, some of them are in the middle of the word and some are at the end of the world's word. So it doesn't have to start at the beginning of the word. So you'll see here, there's more than just 16. Um, these are just examples of additional larger letters. This one is consistent. This, this one here is very well known. And then where's the other one? Um, this one here. So this is in the same sentence has two large letters and together they spell, spell out is ed. Ed is witness, and it spells out a witness, right? So this, what it usually means, the one thing that it always means is that there's some extra hidden secrets in this word centered around this letter, okay? That's the one consistent thing that we can say. Like you'll see here, um, there's even smaller letters, but we're talking about the bigger letters here. This one's in the middle of the word. This one's at the end of the word. So you'll see. So we'll talk about this big bet, right? This big bet. It has a, it has a very important um significance so it's the second letter in the hebrew alphabet so right away um there's a very famous question um it's brought about in the gemara um it's talked about a lot why doesn't the torah start with the letter aleph why doesn't it start with the first letter right this is the very beginning why don't we start with the first letter why does it have to start with the second letter right it has a numerical value of two so that question we're going to answer the first question we're going to answer the second question too why does the torah begin with duality and plurality right why doesn't it begin with unity, right? What's this duality thing, right? It represents space, uh, a place. So literally the, the word bet means house, or it's used um, at the beginning of a word to imply in, right? In the beginning. So this is the in part of the beginning, in. In what, right? In in space. So it, it implies space. How A house is a, dwell, is a space, a in is a space. So the, this letter has a very strong connotation of space. Um, and in, and with it, with the context of in, we should also ask, like, what's the opposite of in, right? Like, this is adding context in, right? What's the, what's the opposite of in? Why, why aren't we start starting with, with out? Why do we need to start it with in, right? And um, also, why does it start with the most explosive sound, right? In English, we go boom, bang, blast. These are all explosive sounds. In Hebrew, it's the same thing. It's the same letter, b, b, bereshit, right? Why is it, it's, it's an explosive uh, sound. So, Starting with why it's the second letter of, of the Hebrew alphabet, the famous question. Um, so first of all, the first letter is Aleph. Aleph symbolizes unity, divinity, silence, right? Like a lot of the names of God start with Aleph. Um, you see here, it's the third letter. It's not, right? So it symbolizes the first. So when we're looking at the beginning of the universe, we cannot see beyond the universe, right? We can only see what comes after. We The second, we can't see what comes before the first, right? And we'll get into that a little bit deeper, right? But... So there is a significance why it starts with the second letter. Um, and the rest of the Torah has several commandments to sanctify firsts. We'll see that later. The firstborn, the first fruit, and generally treats first as requiring some kind of redemption, right? Everything that's first. So this is the first letter, and it's fitting that it's, it's the second because it needs some, to be redeemed as the first, right? It's not the primary cause, but a result. So the Maharal of Prague um, uh, brings in an idea when he's, uh, this is in Gvulat Hashem, he talks about Egypt as worshiping the first as divine, right? Egypt had this idea that the first is the divine, right? And the death of the firstborn, as he says, was a direct response to this ideology in order to teach them that every first is actually second to God and does not replace him. So every first that can be perceived is therefore not a cause, but a result of a more primary cause, right? And so this is kind of um, an answer to this, this question. It's, uh, you know, don't, don't worship the first because the first is always second. It's got a numerical value of two. So why does it start with duality and plurality? Um, so the fundamental foundation of the universe is division, duality, and plurality. We can't see the inherent oneness in, in, in unity, right? This is the traditional answer. We see differentiation. So it's also very fitting that that bet is from the, the, the numerical standpoint. Um, it represents space. So what's the opposite of in, right? So the inherent assumption is that you know, the it's the beginning of space itself, but the opposite of in is not, it's not out, but without, right? It provides context that everything after this is within, right? It's giving context. Everything after this is within the universe. Okay. And the opposite of it is without the universe, right? Outside of space makes no sense, right? It makes no sense. And so now we're talking, so the context is space. Space is the beginning context. All of the rest of the Torah and humanity and the universe all happens in right? There's no, there's no out. 
So it, it makes sense that this provides the, the first letter is providing context for everything else. Okay. And why the explosive sound. So Aleph is, is silent. Um, so there's no sender. There's no receiver. There's no change. Bet is an explosion, the most violent event in history. It's a large bet, right? In English, we call it the big bang, the big bet, right? You know, the, the stretching of space, right? Um, it's large because it's stretching, right? So, uh, oh, the stretching of space is also confirmed in physics, but this is more of a Kabbalistic idea as well. So it, there's a confirmation there too. Okay, so the second letter, uh, resh, um, it literally means head. The word resh means head, um, and it represents the beginning. And so it has a curvature. The letter itself has some kind of curvature. You see the curvature, like a literal head. And and uh, a famous question is like, what's north of the North Pole? Um, it, like it's there's no north of the North Pole. There's no there's nothing above the head, right? And so we see even the 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 beginning, like bet, the bet, the first letter doesn't even represent the beginning. The second letter represents the beginning. So there's something even before the beginning, right? There's, it's like, what's north of the North Pole? The bet. The bet is before the beginning. The bet is above the head. And and so two, so two is the number of duality, right? Two is this first number. Um, Resh has a number of 200. So we, so, so we start at two times 10 is 20. We don't go to 20. We go straight to 200. So it's like skipping. It's like this rapid expansion is so strong that it breaks our idea of continuity. It breaks our perception of continuity. It's just so rapid that we we can't understand the continuousness between the two and the 200, right? There's no there's no natural progression. Together, these first two letters uh, form bar, bar. And the word bar in Hebrew is used in many other places, and it means emissive, to come out of, right? It's used in Hebrew to describe offspring, um, and it's creative and unfolding process of causality, right? It's, it's saying that there's there's Baal is coming out of something else. It's it, there's a causality involved in Baal. So there's something first, and then there's something second. So right away we're starting with some kind of cause causality starting here, right? And the next letter Aleph, which is the first letter, only comes third. And together this word Bara, it's actually the second word here, right? It literally means to create, right? In the beginning, create. This is this is the word create, and so we see create is here. So it's it's like the second word is an echo of the first. And when we're looking at the first word, we actually end up understanding the second word, creating, before we understand the first word, right? Um, so the second word is an echo of these, these first three letters. We understand the second word before we understand the first one. Perceiving the beginning can only come about by perceiving its echo, right? Only by seeing the echo of the beginning, which is today, we see all of the echo, can we look back at, at, at the, the word Bereshit? So the Bereshit is not directly accessible. The third letter Aleph, just like the third word starts with Aleph. So you see the third letter is Aleph, and then the third word is Aleph. So Aleph has some special place with three here, right? So why must it come third? And we see later that the third and the seventh day are special, right? All the days God saw that it was good. On the third day, God saw that it was very good, right? So we can make two words out of this, Bar Aleph, or come, comes out of Aleph, right? So if you split the word to Bar Aleph, it, it comes out of divinity, right? So generally speaking when we use the word bar we say what 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 came out of what so this this didn't come out of something something came out of this right so so in a way aleph putting it together is saying that aleph comes before right putting it together in this way says aleph really should come before coming out of aleph is the rest but we don't we don't realize that aleph should be first until afterwards we don't we don't see unity and divinity at the beginning. We can only see it after the beginning in the purpose that the beginning serves. Right? It's as if the book is telling us, "Don't look at the beginning to find divinity." Okay. The next letter, Shin. So Shin is a, a dualistic letter. It I'm not going to get into it, but it represents um, there's a secret inner three and an outer four with Shin. Okay, and that's just a secret for another day. Um, but um, it symbolizes change. Um, the word for change in Hebrew is Shinui. Right. Um, and also like shin, shin, nun, like shinui, and also shana is the Kabbalistic word for time is shana, right? This is something also in physics, um, change and time are synonymous. There's no time without change. There's no change without time. They're the same thing, right? So uh, the Vilna Gon, um, there's a quote here from him. He says, what is Bereshit the beginning of? It's the beginning of time itself. This here too, in physics, there's no time without change, oscillations between states, right? How do we measure time? We measure time through change, right? We we can't even track time. Time doesn't even have any meaning unless change is happening, right? And the whole, you know, twin experiment, faster than light, time, time dilation, all this kind of stuff only happens 
because change is slowing down. That's the only way we can actually track time, right? Okay, and 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 so we can make a few words out of these first four letters now. So bara shin, it creates and admits change in time, right? So one of the first emissions is one. What comes out of it is time. Um, also, if uh, if we take the the next three letters without the bet, rosh is the it's the literal word for head, right? So so not only is does resh represent head, but the word for head also shows up here, right? So admitted from the unity is change. Um, time and change. Um, also, if you take just these two letters, Aleph and Shin, right? These two letters here um, in the first four, um, it means fire, esh, right? It's the literal word for fire. So fire also symbolizes change in, um, and uh, through destruction, right? And this is Kabbalistically, this is the, the, the fire and Shin also both represent change, um, but this is more change through destruction and tropic increase um, so the, there's a question here, what was destroyed, right? What What is the destruction that happened here? Why is there fire? Um, and these letters also symbolize um, El Shaddai, right? El Shaddai, two letters, one of the divine names, right? This is, it's very common. Fire symbolizes, the word for fire also symbolizes this divine name. So the first time we see it is in Genesis 17, um, when Abraham was 99 years old, um, um, God appeared to Abraham and said to him, I am El Shaddai, walk before me and be innocent. And it also denotes heat, right? And it's well known today that um, there's a, a big thermal component to this word Bereshit. There's a big thermal component to the beginning of the universe. Bar Esh emitted from fire. Everything after this is emitted from some kind of fire. So Yud, um, Yud is, uh, it's it indicates specificity. Uh, uh, when it's added to the end of the word, it indicates some kind of specificity, and it also represents some kind of absolute potential. Yud is supposed to be a point, um, the smallest possible point, and we know that there, that the universe was also at a smallest possible point at the very beginning. Beginning, so it's very it's very appropriate that a yud would be in this in this word. Kabbalistically, there's an idea that the the universe was the size of a uh, some kind of nut. Um, I don't know what kind of nut. I don't remember, but it was some kind of nut with a shell. There's, there's an idea that the shell, the klipa, is protecting the fruit on the inside, um, but saying that the entire universe was the size of this small thing, and it also symbolizes absolute potential. It hasn't expanded yet. Um, it's ev everywhere else. You see that this is potential. Yud is potential. So it's very suiting that potential and this small, um, um, it's the smallest the universe has ever been, right? Is at this beginning, right? Um, and together, Rashi is first and fundamental, right? So this is talking, this is the this is the fundamental first, right? It's connected to the word first. And so it's not just a first, it's the first, it's the beginning, right? Um, and the last letter, Taf, um, it, it's, it's the last letter of the Hebrew uh, alphabet. So it also symbolizes completion, some kind of completion. So it's very, and when it's at, at the end of the word like this as well, it, it, it shows that this word comes at, this, this is a complete word from beginning, middle to end has some kind of complete process involved in it. So this is where the idea of the comes from in this little ending here. Um, this, this dichotomy also between absolute potential and completion is here as well, right? Um, you have a few dichotomies in this word, um, but this dichotomy is very extreme where it's absolute small potential and completion and also fundamental first source when Rashid Right, so we had here Rashi is like first and fundamental. When you add this extra letter, it's it it adds a, a, a source idea to it. It's a Rashit, Rashit, Chokma, the, the beginning, the source. So there's many more ways to understand this, but this is how we get the words in the right. This was at the end, right? You see, it's at the end, but in the beginning. So it's one of many ways to understand this, but it is a valid translation. So this translation is it's it's okay that the translation is there. But there's just so much more to this word. Um, and you see here, there's also more that I didn't talk about um, uh, many different ways. And th there's many more that I don't even know about, right? So these are, these are just the ones that I'm I'm aware that I didn't talk about, right? So, okay, let's keep going. In the beginning created God. Okay. So the second word, we already know what it means because we saw it in the first word. It's just an echo of the first word. It means created, um, coming out of. So, but so the third word here, now I don't like gematria a lot. Gematria, it's useful. I find it useful as a mnemonic, mnemonic. It's good, but not as a proof, right? It's a good to, it's a good way to remember things, right? So the word 
the word Elohim, the mnemonic for it is because the numerical mnemonic, it's actually the same numerical value as Hateva, right? Um, nature, right? And it's a very appropriate mnemonic. Um, and we'll see why Elohim is translated as nature and why why it's used. I just don't like using gematria as a proof. Like it's not a good proof to me. It's just a good way to remember. So Nachmanides, uh, uh, Rabbi Moshe ben Nachman, um, brings this. He, he brings, brings an explanation and a description of what this word actually means, right? So I'm going to base my understanding on him. So when we're talking about the gods of the nations or, or the uh, idolatrous gods, we use the word elim, right? Th this middle section is taken out, taken out, and we're just talking elim, right? And this is what Nachmanides brings. And he, and he says that el, the beginning of this, is just it's just a natural force. It's a power. He calls it a power, a natural force. Um, and so you see that the gods the gods of mythology and stuff like this are all personifications of some kind of natural phenomenon, right? It's just like a common thread. So you got the God of thunder, the God of rain, the God of the sea, the God of war, the God of lust, etc. These are all natural phenomenon, natural forces, forces of nature. And so the, the word for that in Hebrew is elim. And so when you add these two letters in the middle of it, right? Da smack dab in the middle, the vav and the hey, some kind of manifestation in reality, right? And so... And it's also the second half of the Tetragrammaton, which is um, supposedly the highest name for God. Um, the Vav means literally um, when you use it, you use it as the word and as just a letter. It's and together with, right? So there's some, some kind of connection quality to the word Vav. Um, the literal, if you say Vav in Hebrew, um, not just the sound it makes, V, V means and, but Vav as as the, the name of the letter it means hook or a connection. So it has the same kind of meaning and together with connection. In modern Hebrew, you say vav is the um, is the uh, the part of the car that connects to the trailer is is this is called the vav I don't remember what it's called in English. Also, you see it in the tabernacle. There's like the hooks connecting the the uh, it's they're called vavim. Um, and so kabbalistically, it means delineation, unfolding. And the, the word ishtal shalut is a Kabbalistic term. So it's it's the connection, the process between um, the divine will and reality. What's what's so the Kabbalistic idea of the vav is is the connection between the divine and reality, right? This connection. It's the unfolding, the delineation process, right? Um, and so here we have, uh, without talking about the hey yet, we have the forces of nature, the el, connect delineating to plurality. But what you'll notice is there is no actual vav in this word for Elohim. The vav is missing. It's gone, right? And if I try to spell it like this, I, I did a copy paste here. You see spell check shows up and it's like, hey, this is spelt wrong. There's missing a vav here purposefully. So the miss, so the vav, the reason why I'm talking about it is because there is a void of it. And, and the void is also significant. So the understanding, it should be there. And so the, the, the deeper understanding is the void also shows something. So the missing hidden vav changes the word, indicating a missing component, right? The vav symbolizes uh, the connection and delineation. And so the, the words are telling us that we can never truly see the precise connection and delineation between the beginning and the forces of nature that come about as a result, right? And so so it's hidden to us. We, we, we know that there's a connection. We know that there's a delineation, but we can't see it. It's hidden. And the text is telling us, hey, you're never going to be able to see this. You know it's there. Everyone knows it's there, but we can't actually see it. So these hidden initial conditions actually contain purpose, right? Um, well, this is the claim, at least, right? The first mention of Elohim is lesser or diminished because of the hidden purpose. There's a hidden purpose here. So, so what is this missing connection is really the question we're going to ask. And really... The, 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 this is the question that physics is trying to answer. And this is the question that um, a lot of the book uh, afterwards is all trying to answer. What is this missing connection that we don't have, that we don't see, right? Um, and this is the, the real investigation that's going on. Okay, so the idea of hey, it symbolizes manifestation and presence. It symbolizes the vessel, right? Um, where, where, where do things delineate to is this idea of hey, right? This vessel. And so the, the, this physical presence. Um, so it's man so manifestation without delineation leads us to believe in creation as a sudden act and not a gradual process, right? So the fact that this vav is missing, the fact that all we see is the manifestation of it is 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 really 
telling of reality because that's really what happens. Like the vav should be there. There should be some kind of delineation process to get to the manifestation, but we don't see that process. All we see is the manifestation. That's all that's left, right? So it hides, it also hides the will and intention. If all you see is the manifestation, you don't see the will behind the manifestation, the delineation and manifestation through the forces of nature. Okay, so the theory of evolution really took hold in universities. It started taking hold in about 1940, and by 1950, it was completely accepted in all of universities by biologists. Um, Rabbi Cook wrote this um, probably around 1905-ish, um, so long before um, most people would have naturally heard about evolution as a as a acceptable theory. So it wouldn't have even been controversial for him to just ignore it or deny it or not talk about it, right? But he did talk about it. Um, he didn't confirm it. He didn't say evolution is the way things happen, but he 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 didn't ignore it either. He says evolution, the evolutionary concept better suits the Kabbalistic perception of the world than any other philosophical system to date. So he's not saying evolution is how it happened, but he's saying this idea of evolution is is just it's ancient. It's Kabbalistic. It's something that that he just is just so surprising to him that nature that um, science is is finding it because this is really what Kabbalah has always been teaching this delineation process this missing vav right um, and so here let's translate it better now that we have a better understanding of the actual words so we could say we say the explosive fiery emanation of space time and change right Bereshit this fiery explosion of of creation of space time and change is what brought about not God but the forces of nature manifesting in plurality, right? So this so this is a precursor. This is a creation, the forces of nature and, and the manifestation of the forces of nature. Uh, they came about because of this fiery explosion of emanation and emanation of space, time, and change, right? In, in a hidden process, right? The process, the vav, this process, this delineation process is hidden, right? Um, and so all of this happened in a hidden process. And this is really what science is trying to connect today is, okay, yeah, we see the forces of nature. We see the plurality, how they're manifesting in plurality, all of these various different forces of nature. Um, and we we see the beginning, the fiery explosion, the emanation of space and time and change. We know that was there, but we don't really know the connection between the two, right? And that's all what all of physics is trying to really figure out right now, um, at least physics that's looking at this time in the universe, right? So Elohim, it's it's a manifestation that is expressed after the universe came into being, right? So this is a manifestation that came after the universe. Um, so it, it's 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 a creation. It's not the creator. <laughs> so there's a common uh, Kabbalistic mystical idea um, that the vessel must be created before its contents. Um, um, before you can fill the vessel, before you can have the contents of the vessel, the the filling of it, you need to have the vessel first to contain it, right? Uh, yeah, there's many examples you can think of, but it's like it's like, you know, be before you go and open the tap to get your water, you're gonna need a cup. You need a cup before you fill the cup, right? Um, so the vision comes before the implementation, right? But the process within the process is realized after, right? Um, the first, uh, also the first item in whatever you put in in first is the last item that comes out, right? So perfect. Uh, the purpose. This, this first item in, this purpose, is revealed in the third. It's revealed afterwards. So one thing that the text is telling us really strongly is we do not see proof of God in the beginning of the universe, right? It starts with the second. It doesn't start with godliness. It doesn't start with the Aleph. It starts with this, this guttural bet, this, this, um, this explosive, this, the beginning isn't, doesn't seem to have some kind of divine connection to it, right? Um, we cannot see beyond the top of the head. We cannot see the div divinity in the beginning. So the text is telling us, don't look for God here. Um, we we are of the universe and thus we can only observe from within it. Every first will always be second to something, right? And so we know this first is second to something. We don't, we, we can never ac ever access that something, right? And so, and the other thing is what most of us refer to as God, what most people call God is really just a manifestation of God within the universe, right? It's a creation, not the creator. So what mo are we have most people have this con conception and this understanding of what God is, and what this text is telling us, what we no normally translate as God, isn't actually God. It's a creation. Our conception of God is a creation. It's not the Creator itself. Um, we can never really have an accurate conception of the Creator. And just knowing that, knowing that our understanding of God is 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 a creation. So therefore, so th this means the mistranslation 
it's actually idolatrous. Saying that this created the beginning is actually idolatrous because this is a creation. This isn't actually God. This isn't actually what came first. This is what came first in thought. This is what first came first in purpose, but it's not what came first in practice, right? It's, it's a creation. It's an entity within the universe. Um, so the mistranslation is idolatrous. The actual translation, although it seems idolatrous, it's not actually idolatrous at all. You can't have a force of nature in reality before the existence of reality. That's the first thing we can ever get to. It's not the first, it's the second, but the first thing we can ever actually see is this physicality. Um, and this has to come about before we see the purpose. The purpose comes after the physicality is there. The vessel gets filled afterwards, right? Um, so just about me, I wasn't I wasn't raised in a religious house with a religious background. So, But when I began looking into this, I was already in the middle of a degree in engineering physics, right? So I was already completely in the science world. And I was completely surprised to discover how closely these first three words mirrored our current understanding of physics. And I was really confused why there was any conflict between the two. It's like, okay, they're the same thing. Like, um, you know, you know, I might, you, you might not believe in God. You might, you know, question the Torah as a divine source. You might question all kinds of things, but at least these first three words are confirmed by physics. And so, and so like, you don't, you don't have to believe in the entire Torah. You don't have to believe in God, but these first three words aren't, aren't divine in nature. They're very physical and they're, they they align with physics. So so there shouldn't really be a conflict here. And I see a lot of conflict and a lot of debate here. And a lot of people try to prove God here. And, and, and this is the wrong place. The Torah itself tells us, if you're looking for God, this is not the place to look, right? This is the place for physics to look, not the place for religion to look. Um, it, it, it tells us that solving this puzzle may lead to a better understanding of the process of creation, but not a better understanding of the creator. Okay, so... Just to reinforce this one last thing, just to reinforce this, this is the first of the Ten Commandments. It's 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 not a commandment; it's an utterance. In Hebrew, we call it Aserat Dibot, the the Ten Utterances, because the first one isn't even a commandment. So it says, "I am I am um, the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt um, from the house of slavery." Right. So the, the, there's a very famous question here. It says, why doesn't it say, I am the Lord, your God who created the universe, right? Certainly the creation of the entire universe is a much greater feat. It's a greater act. What all you did was take this small people in the small corner of the universe out of Egypt. Big deal. You created the entire universe. Why are you introducing yourself as this, right? And so, and so it's a very, it's a very logical question, right? So the consistent message is that um, proof or disproof of God cannot be found in the beginning. God, God is bringing this as a, as a proof of his existence. Um, and this is where you see the proof after the beginning, right? And so a, there's also an additional message here that God wants to be known for his acts within creation, not for the act of creation itself, right? Big deal. Like, okay, you, you made a child, big deal. You made a child. Um, th the bigger deal is to be a loving parent, right? Um, if, if, if you stick around and you're a loving parent and you act within creation and you have a purpose with that child and you help the child grow and develop, that shows a lot more. Um, that's that's what you, uh, uh, any father should want to be known for, right? They sh they don't need to be known for the act that brought the child about, right? This this beginning act, right? Um, you know where that's going. Anyways, I hope I hope you, if you made it to the end, good good for you. I hope this helped you sort of understand that there shouldn't really be a conflict here. Um, if you're religious, don't look here. Don't like it really irks me that people use the beginning as a proof for God. This is not a proof for God. There's no proof here. Don't use this in your arguments, right? It's just it's just not a good thing for your arguments because your own text is telling you do not use this for your arguments, right? Also, science. Don't come and say, hey, we can disprove God by looking at the... Like, this is... It's also kind of dumb. It's like, you're not going to disprove God by showing that, the begin, that there's no God in the beginning. The text itself is telling you that, right? So it's just... This is a moot point. This is not a good place to argue. And this is really the main message I want to bring across here. Um, okay. Anyways, thanks for watching. Thanks for getting this far. And um, yeah, I'm, uh, I'll get back to my normal content and just just taking a little sort of side tangent to address this, this annoying argument <laughs> that I always see happen. And it's like both sides are wrong to try to use this as proof or disproof of God. And this is just my pe personal pet peeve. So anyways, have a good one.